City Club of Eugene's May 10th, 2024 program. My name is Andrew Kalk and I am City Club's president. We're coming to you today from headquarters wine bar and shop in downtown Eugene and it's my pleasure to extend a warm welcome to our speakers and to all of you joining us here in person, online and over the radio. For three decades, the City Club of Eugene has remained dedicated to its founding mission to build community vision through open inquiry. In accordance with our mission and purpose, we hope to help connect people throughout our community and across generations, identities, experiences, and perspectives. You are invited this week and every week to join us in this effort, to share your wisdom, to learn something new, and to take active steps to make a difference in this city and region that we love. Of course, we cannot do this work alone, so a special thank you this morning to our Platinum Community and Diamond sponsors. The Eugene Area Chamber of Commerce, serving as a catalytic leader in creating a vibrant and diverse economy that drives economic opportunity and well-being. Kaiser Permanente, which exists to provide high-quality, affordable health care services and to improve the health of our members and the communities we serve. More information at www.kp.org. The University of Oregon has helped Oregonians question critically, think logically, reason effectively, communicate clearly, act creatively, and live ethically since 1876. More information at uoregon.edu. Peace Health has been proud to serve Eugene, Lane County, and beyond as your hometown health care partner for more than 80 years. The Peace Health mission is to keep you and your family healthy. Learn more at peacehealth.org. Lane Community College transforms lives through learning. LCC provides comprehensive, accessible, high-quality educational opportunities that promote student success. For more information, visit lanecc.edu. Thank you to the City of Eugene and to Lane County for their support as well. Whether you're joining us for the first time or you're a longtime listener, I invite you to support our work by becoming an individual member, a business or community sponsor, or volunteering to be part of our committee or our board. You can do those things and more at cityclubofeugene.org. From the vineyard to the tasting room, Eugene is at the heart of the Southern Willamette Valley's wine industry, and we are honored today to welcome an expert panel of local and statewide leaders to discuss this growing part of our economy. Justin King is King Estate Winery's National Sales Manager, Morgan McLaughlin is the Executive Director of the Willamette Valley Wineries Association, and Aaron Schwartz is the owner of Julian Sinclair, a Eugene-based wine importer and distributor, and also our host today here at headquarters. Please join me in welcoming our panel. Okay. <laughs> well, hi everybody. It's a it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Justin King, and um, as Andrew mentioned, uh, thanks for that great introduction, Andrew. Um, I'm with King Estate Winery. Um, let's see. We can, this is a it's a it's tough to know where to start here, but I would say that uh, the the Oregon wine industry uh, is it's it's uh, it's been incredible to watch it grow uh, over the last you know 30 years. My my family's company started our first vintage was 1992, and uh, really you know just maybe a couple dozen you know uh, uh, you know commercially operating wineries in the state at that time, and I think there's about a thousand roughly a thousand labels at this point, um, so a huge amount of growth. But you know, before I kind of just dive into uh, a lot of numbers and 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 um, so the history here, I think it would be good to pass pass the mic down a little bit and uh, share share the intro here. Can you use that one? Okay. Um, as previously mentioned, I'm Morgan McLaughlin. I'm the executive director of the Willamette Valley Wineries Association and newly formed Wine Foundation, which is our philanthropic arm. Um, I'm going to be talking specifically about um, the history of the Willamette Valley, some current initiatives around sustainability, also talking a little bit about tourism and business climate here in the southern Willamette Valley and the importance of Eugene in being an anchor for uh, wine tourism to the valley. Uh, I'm Aaron Schwartz. I'm, along with my wife, the owner of this establishment and also a small distribution and import company based in Eugene. I'm going to be talking about this wine bar here in Eugene and the local scene, but also about uh, a niche in the market that we fill um, that's developed in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, the wine industry has 
at least in this state, changed in the last 10 to 15 years as much as it did in the 50 preceding. So I'm going to highlight some of the more unusual, exciting things that are happening. So one thing to just to start us off with a little bit of perspective about kind of how, the impact of the Oregon wine industry uh, today. Um, this is a study from 2022, our last economic impact study. And the uh, current uh, statewide, this is not just for Lane County, of course, but current statewide economic impact of the wine industry in 2022 was $8.1 billion. And when we talk about that economic impact, that is um, uh, creating jobs relating uh, to industries like farming, banking, accounting, manufacturing, packaging, transportation, printing, advertising. So really quite a large uh, economic impact for, for the state um, and each region within the state. Uh, the wine industry generates about $265 million in, in taxes for the state as well. Um, and we uh, create about 40,000 jobs uh, throughout the state. Um, contribution to, of wine-related tourism to the state's economy in 2022 was $758 million. So it's really grown quite significantly as an industry. Um, and, and all the while, it's done so while kind of, I, I would say, uh, embodying who we are and, and, and our values. Uh, we lead the nation in terms of organic and biodynamically certified vineyard acreage. So uh, sustainable farming is, is uh, really quite central to uh, the Oregon wine industry. Um, and then I would also say that uh, it's, it's a special thing that, you know, while we have a few larger producers in the state, actually, uh, 80, 80 plus percent of the producers in the state are producing under 5,000 cases. And they're not necessarily in three-tier distribution either. So that's a lot of sales to, um, in, you know, to restaurants, uh, to uh, wine club members, et cetera, et cetera. So um, really an interesting, very diverse uh, profile that we have in the state for Oregon wine businesses. Have any thoughts on that, Morgan? Now, Justin, you did not mention that you serve on the leadership board of the Oregon Wine Board. Um, do you want to just mention quickly? I guess I should that do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I, I, I have been on the Oregon Wine Board for the last um, five and a half years now. Um, this, this year is my last year. Um, chaired the organization um, in 23 and 22, uh, and I'm still here. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, and, um, the, you know, the Oregon Wine Board is a pretty, pretty fabulous organization. Just went through a, a big uh, revolution, a big change in, in leadership. And um, we're really excited about the future for the organization. Um, this, the, Oregon, the Oregon Wine Board, there are many associations and, and, and uh, groups within the Oregon wine industry. The Oregon Wine Board, though, is, is uh, distinct in that it's a state, uh, a semi-independent state agency. So it's a tax-funded agency. It's funded through a tonnage tax. It's $25 a ton. Uh, half of that's paid by, usually half of that's paid by the winery, half of that's paid by a, a vineyard. If you've got, you know, uh, two different entities there, if it's just one entity, they pay the whole thing. But basically, it's funded through a tonnage tax. And so in that sense, um, we really represent the entire state. So every AVA in the state. And just for anybody who might not know the term AVA, that is American Viticultural Area. And so that's referring to um, areas within the state or regions within the state that have distinct sort of geological or, um, or, or sort of um, uh, climate related um, uh, aspects to them. So, um, so again, there are a number of uh, associations across the state that represent the Oregon wine industry. In the Willamette Valley, we have the Willamette Valley Wineries Association, of which Morgan McLaughlin is uh, the executive director. So um, the Oregon Wine Board works um, very closely with the WVWA and other industry associations uh, as well. Take it away, Morg. <laughs> well, uh, again, thank you everyone for taking the time today. Um, I think it's important to know too that the work that the Oregon Wine Board does um, is centered around three main pillars, education, research, and marketing. Um, all of which are uh, incredibly important for the vitality and health of the overall industry. It's not a membership-based organization, as Justin mentioned. Um, it's industry assessments that pay for um, that industry work. And then when you look at individual regions within the state, 
Um, the Willamette Valley is the largest uh, for both area, planted uh, vineyard acreage, and also the number of producing wineries. And we are particularly excited to um, celebrate this year as the 40th anniversary of the establishment of the Willamette Valley AVA, mm -hmm. which now you know the acronym, American Viticultural Area. And this is a significant period of time in which the federal government gives you official recognition um, as an important place for growing grapes. And when you have a milestone birthday um, or anniversary, it's a really good chance to look back at the history and the progress um, that the industry has had and also look forward to, you know, what do the next 40 years look like? Where are there areas of opportunity? Where are there headwinds and challenges? Um, to give you the framing, as I said, we're the largest um, growing area. We uh, represent in total acreage about three and a half million total acres. Um, that's not planted acres. Uh, we're um, just over 30,000 uh, planted acres, and that is running from, believe it or not, the city of Portland is within the um, AVA boundaries. So that northern part of Willamette Valley all the way down to the southern end and the Eugene area. We, uh, within the Willamette Valley, we have what we call nested AVAs. So 11 official uh, growing regions. Um, we call them nested because they're part of the family. Uh, sometimes terminology is used uh, like sub-AVA, but um, we like to use the word nested to indicate uh, more cohesion and um, connection. Most of those um, nested AVAs began forming in the northern part of the valley, but as our region is maturing and we're looking at the next 40 years, I expect that continued development of nested AVAs to continue down south, which I think is an important continuing story for the Willamette Valley is looking at areas and unique places uh, for growing grapes. You all know this, but it's a good reminder that Pinot Noir is our most uh, widely planted, most widely made wine. Uh, when any of you travel the globe or go to other parts of the country and you say, I'm from Eugene, I'm from the Willamette Valley, I'm from Oregon, and if someone knows wine and food, they will often associate, oh, Pinot Noir. Um, and so it's an important flagship for us, um, and it's also uh, an important differentiation for Oregon and the Willamette Valley. There are very few places in the U.S. that can grow Pinot Noir, and we are blessed to have the climate and terroir to make some of the best in the world. Um, and to um, give you a bit of framing for that, uh, we are, I am, traveling to Italy tomorrow morning to be on a panel with executive leaders from other European wine growing regions. We are the only U.S. region represented, and it's really a testament to how much Oregon and Willamette Valley has grown in reputation that we get to sit at a table next to uh, executives from Burgundy, Bordeaux, Portugal, Champagne. So it's a sense of local pride for all of you, even if you don't drink wine. Um, it's, it's important to know that it's something to be very proud of, just like when you wear your Nike shoes and people are like, oh, it's Oregon made. It's, it's important that we have a thriving industry. But I think what you might be talking about is there's a lot of other exciting varieties being grown, uh, different wine styles. Pinot Gris, which I think um, King Estate is, I think. We've, we've, we've grown some. We've grown some. <laughs> yeah. um, um, is the second most planted grape variety in the Willamette Valley. We're also getting a lot of excitement around Chardonnay. Um, you may have heard of another acronym called ABC. This was anything but Chardonnay, and it was a little bit of based on kind of a generic uh, flavor profile for um, California Chardonnay. It's a very generalization. And people are getting re-energized and re-excited about Chardonnay, especially coming from Oregon and the Willamette Valley. There's a, a vibrancy and a uniqueness 
Um, so it's just exciting to see the growth of other varieties and, and other folks kind of pushing the boundaries of, of wine making and style and representation. And I think that's when we look at the next 40 years, that's gonna be an exciting um, maturing of our industry. Um, anywhere you go in the world, you all know this. You mentioned Oregon, Eugene. They think of green, they think of sustainability. Um, they think of preserving land, preserving community. And I think that's really woven into the wine industry as well. Justin mentioned uh, certifications that historically have been very centered on land, um, being good stewards to land. But what we're also seeing now is the recognition of human sustainability. Um, and you see that in new programs for uh, vineyard stewards. And the fact that we no longer call those who work in the vineyard workers, we call them stewards. They're stewards of the land um, and important touch points. Um, there is um, ag overtime now for vineyard stewards. There are education opportunities for those um, to advance their careers, potentially move into tasting room and cellar work. So that's um, an exciting development. And we also have more wineries becoming B Corp certified, which is looking at kind of a more holistic approach to sustainability within a business model. Um, and that also includes the human component. And then two years ago, um, we formed the Willamette Valley Wine Foundation. So this is a 501c3 uh, Oregon-based charity that is at the intersection of affordable housing, early childhood education, and health care. And um, I think that's a testament to the growing and maturing of the Willamette Valley wine industry, but also recognizing the importance of thriving and sustainable communities. So we're excited about that future work. Um, you should also know and be proud that when you buy a bottle of Oregon wine and it says Oregon on the label, which um, I'm sure you can um, uh, give some feedback on, that wine is 100% from Oregon. There, there are no grapes from California. There are no grapes from Washington. And the industry led um, the development of more strict labeling regulations than the federal government requires. And I think um, historically that has positioned and protected Oregon as a brand. Um, the value of when you buy and drink an Oregon wine, that you know it's from Oregon, that place matters. Um, let's, say, let's say most of them are from Oregon. <laughs> we, we, yes. We, <laughs> yes. No, we, and, and it's really, so just to really jump in there really quickly, yeah. the federal standard for content uh, for, uh, and labeling is 75%, uh, it, basically the wine has to be 75% the variety that you say it is. Then it can be 25% sort of whatever you want, more or less from wherever you want. In Oregon, I believe, if you, if you want to call it Willamette Valley Pinot Noir, I believe it's 95. I believe it's 95. 95% mm -hmm. uh, of the wine has to be from the Willamette Valley. Well, actually, sorry, 100% of the wine has to be from Oregon. 95% of the wine has to be from Willamette Valley, and 95% of it has to be Pinot Noir. So uh, we have very high standards uh, for our labeling and, and uh, content. Yeah. And when there are producers from California that don't follow the rules, <laughs> We make sure that they follow the rules. Make sure that they follow the rules. So um, our association really works um, diligently on this import, the importance of protecting um, place names. And so um, on the international um, world, we work um, collaboratively with 33 other countries, uh, wine producing countries and regions, uh, where we are all mission to protect our individual place names. And this work started originally from Champagne, where producers around the world outside of Champagne were using the word Champagne. Champagne is not made anywhere else in the world other than Champagne. And that is something that we, uh, as an ethos, agree with. Just like Willamette Valley, there's only one Willamette Valley in the world, and we don't want others misusing that name. Um, and we made that official in the EU in 2021. 
We have protected Willamette Valley um, in, its, in its use for wine. Uh, we are the only, us and the Napa Valley are the only two US wine regions that have name protection in the EU. Napa uh, recently has protected name use in China. Um, so we expect um, as exports continue to evolve, China continues to be an opening market that will be looking for name protection in China. Um, just intellectual property uh, protection is important there. Um, and then I just lastly, um, you know, the pandemic has had um, incredible impacts on the wine industry, um, the tourism industry specifically. And we are very much uh, still in a recovery mode. I think one of the biggest um, challenges to wine was um, kind of an overnight movement to reservation only models. You probably all remember prior to the pandemic that you just drop into tasting rooms, like let's go to wine country, get up in the morning. Um, and that changed during the pandemic for obvious um, health and safety and, and government uh, um, uh, regulation requirements. Um, and that's, that's continued to be um, something that evolves in our industry is, you know, how do we continue working to welcome people, ensuring that trips to wine country can be spontaneous um, while still kind of creating unique experiences that you know, people plan for and get excited about. So I think when we're looking at the next phase of, of pandemic tourism recovery, we're gonna see, I think, an expansion of new experiences, whether it's hikes in the vineyards or you know, bring your dog um, or learn blending in the cellar to also a return to more casual walk-in uh, tasting experiences. So I think you're gonna see an expansion on both of those sides. Um, Portland um, obviously has had an impact on tourism to Oregon, not just for wine tourism. We definitely have had people who say we're not going to come to Oregon um, because of what's happening in Portland, we don't feel safe. Um, so we, as an industry, have you know tr tried to work on messaging, and I think this also creates a unique opportunity for the Southern Willamette Valley. Um, that there are two gateways to the valley: there's Portland to the north, and there's Eugene to the south. I think the expansion of a return to commercial air service in Salem. Um, is exciting also because that's going to bring more people and just give um, another area of opportunity. I think having um, more opportunities for access um, is important f for tourism, uh, especially for wine tourism. Um, I just was in Seattle for the week and you know it's super easy to get from Portland to Seattle. It's really hard to get from Portland to um, other parts of the Willamette Valley on public transportation. So I think that's gonna be an interesting development over the next 40 years. And I feel like I've gone over my 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think the most value I can bring to this discussion is to talk about a small company in the wine industry in Oregon. Um, and there's a lot of things that were brought up that I think I can touch on from a different perspective. I mean, the wine industry, Justin mentioned, is mostly family-owned, small production. Um, there's just so many wineries that make 2,000 cases, 1,000 cases, 5,000 cases. And it sounds like a lot, but it's very, very little. So that's really the backbone of the industry. And we sit in this middle portion, uh, which is as a distributor or a wholesaler and an importer, and we perform a function that's very important in the way that the Oregon tiered system is set up where we move wine from wineries to restaurants or to wine shops or to grocery stores. Now, wineries can do that themselves separately and many of them do, but as you can imagine, as you grow, you need a distribution network. I mean, what we do is more than 50% of what we do is logistics. How do we get the van from our warehouse to the customer? 
or how do we get the wine from the winery to our warehouse? And the, the way that the industry is set up right now on the wholesale side, which again is a part of the industry that I think regular people don't think of and they don't need to think about it. But um, in Oregon, customers, retail customers, need to pay for the wine when it is delivered on the wholesale side. So the entire supply chain is really tight. So you can imagine it's not easy being a restaurant before the pandemic. It's especially not easy during and after the pandemic. A restaurant is not going to order more wine than they need if they have to pay for it right when it comes through the door. So we're frequently delivering to the same restaurant twice a week in Portland. Um, so, but back to sort of the small business, I mean, we're 10 people. We cover the whole state. Half of those people do logistics. They do warehouse work. They're driving. We have a driver right now going to Bend to do our weekly delivery. Um, and then we are sales. So we're a part of that kind of small family owned wine industry in Oregon that I think a lot of people don't think about. And our side is the wholesale side and import side is very active in Oregon and always has been. There's been some consolidation over the last few years, but there's a lot of small, I would actually argue we're kind of a medium sized distributor. Um, that are facilitating the movement of wine to where you where you all are purchasing it or seeing it in the store. Um, but I also want to touch on uh, a couple of things. So we talked about how, you know, in, in Willamette Valley, um, the requirements are stricter. If you're going to say you're Willamette Valley Pinot Noir, you have to have 95% Pinot Noir and the federal rules are 75%. One thing that's very nice about AVAs uh, in the United States and the way they're regulated, which is very different from Europe, is that you have the freedom to use that AVA and grow any grape you'd like as long as you're within that AVA. If you're making wine in Burgundy, you only have a few grapes to choose from. And that's based on history, tradition. Frankly, people in Burgundy probably aren't going to grow something else because it's not worth what Pinot Noir from Burgundy is. But kind of in the American spirit, things are much more open here. I mean, the industry is new. It's very creative. And in the last 10 to 15 years, there's been an explosion of small wineries that um, have been experimenting with different varietals, not just Pinot Noir, not just Pinot Gris. Chardonnay is up and coming, of course. But I mean, there are thousands of other varietals. And the Willamette Valley is very big. So there's lots of microclimates. There's lots of suitable, unexplored areas in the Willamette Valley to grow all these other grapes. And as the world gets smaller, you know, people in Oregon are aware of Chardonnay from Jura and all these unusual places in France and they, they drink it and so they think, wow, maybe we can do that in Oregon. And really that's the position where we are in the market in Oregon. We work with wineries in Oregon and we import, but specifically the Oregon wineries that are very experimental. They're making wine from grapes you've never heard of, Ribola Jala, you know, um, and they're also focusing again on sustainability. Certified organic or biodynamic vineyards are very important in this part of the industry. Um, I'll say a term which is very general and has no, no agreed definition, but very generally I'm speaking of an, a part of the wine industry called natural wine, um, which in my opinion and in generally speaking is less intervention in the winemaking, more creativity, more experimentation. Um, so this part of the industry has just exploded in the last 10 to 15 years. And our business has grown with it through hard work and some luck. We kind of hit that path right at that moment. And, um, you know, about half of our customers are restaurants and the other half are retail. Um, so we represent this sort of new up and coming, exciting part of, of the local industry, which I think adds just, you know, creativity and energy um, to the whole, the whole picture, right? Because a lot of these people who are experimenting and making unusual things are also still making Pinot Noir, or also still making Pinot Gris, but they're branching out and they have this freedom to, to kind of go wild, to be honest. You mentioned natural wine producers and, and, uh, and, and you know, responsible agricultural sort of approaches in the vineyard. It's a, a pretty fun thing to consider that while Oregon makes 1% of the wine in the United States, we are, we're, about, we're about 1% of the wine made in the, in the entire country, we lead the industry in biodynamically certified acreage and organically certified acreage. 
Um, and, uh, and, and of course, we actually also lead when, when it comes to you know, things like media scores and stuff like that. We're, we're, we punch way above our weight. Mm -hmm. but, but to your point, I mean, that it, it's, it's an environment where people are doing a lot of experimentation. The Southern Oregon is doing a, an amazing amount of, of interesting um, experimentation down there. A lot of interesting natural wines as, as well. Um, so yeah, just to echo what you're saying, it's a pretty uh, impressive yeah. stance we take here. It's, it's a unique position in my opinion because even in California, and I mean California has lots of AVAs and experimentation, but you don't see that in Napa, okay? Napa's already more like Burgundy than it is Willamette Valley. So just coming on a little bit later, and also I think by the virtue of having a lot more microclimates and a larger size, has allowed for this like side-by-side -side growth where you can still have world-class Pinot Noir, and of course Oregon Pinot Gris on the map, and then Chardonnay up and coming, you also have this other part of the industry that can grow along with it and speak to different customers and a younger generation, frankly, and mirror some of the trends that are happening in Europe. Natural wine is it's something that actually started in Europe. Um, so kind of back to the roots of where our company is. I mean, we are based in Eugene. We've always been based in Eugene. That is just by coincidence that I'm from Eugene and I didn't want to move to Portland. So we kind of did it backwards. Um, and, you know, Portland is our biggest market in the state. I mean, it drives our numbers. But um, there's some unique positives to being in Eugene. One is we're a distribution company. Eugene's a lot closer to Bend and to Ashland. Uh, for our size, we have a very wide distribution network and regular distribution. We employ half of our team out of Eugene to be able to do farther markets outside. And those markets, you know, may have been somewhat of an afterthought 10, 15 years ago, but they've grown. If you've been to Bend recently, it's a whole new place, basically. So um, that's really, really cool to be here um, and to be able to support, you know, half of our company out of Eugene based. And then it's allowed us to do this place. So um, we function as sort of a representation of our wholesale portfolio and it allows us to kind of bring this unusual product that we wholesale to the market in Eugene. Now we do wholesale in Eugene. We have a lot of great customers. We don't, we don't strive to compete with them and we're, we're actually purposefully trying to show the things that don't end up in Eugene. But this is something where the wholesale side allows us to establish this, this bar and this opportunity to share these new wines in Eugene when I think it would be a very difficult proposition if we didn't have the structure that we do and already being based in Eugene. Can I just put it in a plug for this place? I, I, I'm sorry to tell you this is my first time here, but this is an amazing selection of wines. Headquarters is the name of the is the name of the shop. I haven't I have this is my first time here, but you have some of my favorite Oregon wines. You've got some of my favorite wines from the old world as well. This is beautiful. So, thanks for being in town. Thank you very much. Those of you on the radio couldn't see, but Aaron was giving Justin a ten dollar bill. That's all that took. <laughs> It's also good to know that there's not a single drop of California wine in an Oregon bottle. The horror. Can you believe it? Can you imagine? Uh, thank you very much, everybody. We're going to begin our question and answer in just a moment. But first, I'd like to thank the business and in-kind sponsors whose support helps to make City Club possible. Thank you to our gold sponsors, Network Charter School, Hershner Hunter, LLC, Evans Elder Brown and Subert, Hudson Dental, and our newest gold sponsor, Luvis Cobb. Thank you so much to the folks at Luvis Cobb. Thank you also to our in-kind sponsors, KRVM 91.9 Radio, Alpha IT, Dot Dotson's Photography, and Kid Sports. Also a special thank you to our award-winning public radio station, KLCC FM 89.7, for airing City Club programs Monday nights at 7 p.m. For those listening at home or in the car right now, your household is one of several thousand tuning into City Club on KLCC, and we love that you're here. You can also find all recent City Club programs archived on KLCC, as well as on our YouTube channel and as podcasts. We'll take a brief break before returning for the last part of our program for question and answer. Thanks.
Sandy. Uh, hi, thanks for being here. Original Tower Club member so uh, and City Club member. My question is about climate change. Um, we're talking about maybe a two degree difference and while, uh, how is that going to affect the wine industry, particularly the Pinot Noirs and the Pinot Gris? What's interesting about climate change um, is every growing region for every crop is thinking about what are the impacts um, for them. And sometimes out of crisis, there can be collaboration that didn't exist before and kind of a centered approach of how do we collectively think about the future of the world in a different climate. Um, I recently was uh, traveling for work um, internationally and spent about half a day with the director of uh, Wines of Burgundy and they are investing millions of dollars um, every year looking at uh, new clones of Pinot Noir, new varieties, new ways um, to ensure that their industry is viable. That conversation would have never happened 10 years ago. And I think there isn't a easy solution. I think people have said, oh, there will be no future for Pinot Noir in the Willamette Valley in 40 years. I, I don't know if that's an accurate statement. Um, there's a lot of adaptability that grapevines have. There's also, um, you know, vine new vineyard sites going in higher elevation. Um, there are new trellising systems, as I said, new rootstocks, new, new clones. Agriculture is um, adaptable. Um, we are very special here where many vineyards do not have to be irrigated. Um, we have kind of a, a good climate of a lot of precipitation during dormancy. Um, I was in the industry before in the central coast of California, Santa Barbara area. And one of the reasons I left um, that region was the lack of water and not seeing a sustainable future uh, for grape growing. At the same time, the backdrops of, of fire um, so Oregon is going to certainly have challenges with climate change, um, but I think the resiliency of the global wine industry, um, certainly there will be new varieties um, that will be planted, new ways of making wine, um, but I don't think our industry is, is going away. It will just become more adaptable. And I think also that out of that crisis, we didn't mention it yet, um, is looking at packaging. Um, so we talked about you know, land, uh, we talked about human, but just thinking about the, the carbon footprint of your bottle of wine. Um, a few years ago, if you asked Justin or um, you know, what, what are the gram weights, like what, what is your bottle weight? What is, it used to be the heavier the bottle the more impressive, you know, it, it, it meant an elevated brand. It, you, could, you could get a higher price point. There's dramatic rethinking about that now. It's like, how do we lower um, our footprint? How do we keep lighter weight bottles um, more acceptable? And so as consumers, that's something that you can control. It's like, yeah, the, the weight of a bottle has no indication of the quality of the wine. And we have a new company here that just launched um, this year called Ravino. And it's taking an old concept of a refillable, reusable wine bottle and bringing it back to the industry. So there are three wineries that have just uh, bottled in this new reusable, refillable bottle. And there are um, other bottle projects around the world with this kind of old model. So again, there's a lot of ingenuity in response to climate change, but I'm glad you asked that question. I would just add, I'm a little bit of a ringer for this. I have a master's in atmospheric science. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't study Oregon, but I would echo that I think 
organ is well placed to adapt with kind of the one caveat being wildfire, which is a, a huge risk um, no matter what you grow and how sustainable it is and how hardy it is and how you've adapted. If we get a big wildfire that creates smoke like happened in 2020, it, it's game over. There's not much you can do. I mean, there are some things you can do, but it, it is just something that happens that you have no control over. So to me, I would say, yes, we're, we're really lucky. I mean, Oregon is lucky for climate change in a lot of ways compared to other places, but wildfire is a huge risk. Yeah, I think wildfire is a, a really big one. Um, but as Morgan mentioned, vinifera is, is truly a really adaptable um, uh, uh, life form. <laughs> it's amazing how many different uh, climates it can grow in. As you mentioned, you know, dry farming is pretty much what happens in, in the Willamette. So you could see a future perhaps maybe where eventually, you know, we'll need to do some irrigation, but only probably still in certain areas. The fire thing is a really is is a really important one. 2020, King Estate didn't harvest a single grape off of our vineyard because of smoke impact, and there were many vineyards in the state where that was also the case. Uh, Southern Oregon has, in particular, been dealing with uh, this problem for many years. Um, the AVAs down there primarily are well, Umpqua and Rogue AVAs. But we also have some exciting technologies that we're working with right now and developing to, to, to manage smoke impact. There are some uh, really interesting new filters uh, using um, what are called MIPs. I believe it's molecularly imprinted polymers. And basically it can, it can trap uh, with a high degree of accuracy, um, are much higher than other technologies, um, just the compounds that you want to remove from, from the wine and leave everything else. Um, so it's, it's a work in progress and there's still a lot of experimentation and trial and error to be done with it, but we're, we're, we're on top of that problem as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra Bishop, City Club member. And this, I'm going to bring up one of my, what I'm sure are your, one of your favorite subjects and that is the three tiered system in Oregon. Oregon has a very, um, restrictive system. You might say it was developed in the, I believe in after the depression depression era basically and the idea is that you don't want a producer a distributor and a retailer to have anything to do with each other and Oregon wineries have been very successful over the years in getting exemptions especially for small wineries to allow them as you said is it Aaron to uh, distribute their own wines but do you think it's time to just get rid of the three-tier system in Oregon, or do you think it's still workable? And how are your day-to-day -day interactions going with that? And also from Justin, thanks. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think even if you got rid of the three-tiered system, there's still a place for wholesale and logistics companies. I mean, we do a lot more than just deliver. I mean, we hand sell every wine to every customer. It's one of the few industries of sales that is intensely person to person. People do not buy wine. A restaurant buyer will not buy wine unless they've tasted the wine with a sales rep. Every vintage. Oregon is particularly famous on the wholesale side for being extremely person to person. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm ambivalent to legal structure. I mean, I, I, like I said, I feel like there's a place for wholesales regardless. There are some unusual strict rules like the cash on delivery, which, you know, it warps the industry. I guess I can't say if it's bad or good for a wholesaler. It's great. I don't have accounts receivable. Um, and it warps the industry. It warps the buying habits of people. Um, there are other states that have multiple different versions. So for instance, in New York, you can offer 30 days terms, which is great. But if you don't pay within 30 days, you, your, your name gets posted to a system and nobody's allowed to sell wine to you. Uh, in California, it's like the Wild West. You can do whatever you want. There are restaurants that owe wholesalers tens of thousands of dollars, right? So I guess I don't have an opinion either way for the three-tiered system. And I'm not talking about liquor. That's a, a whole other thing, obviously, in Oregon. Um, I think that some modernization of it would probably benefit uh, everybody involved. Um, but I would be lying if I didn't say a small wholesaler didn't benefit from the current structure, at least to grow. Uh, it's, a, it's a cash flow industry, especially if you're talking about 
inventory. And whether you're a winery or a wholesaler, you have inventory that you need to move. So cash flow is really important. Yeah, we are in business to sell stuff. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's a great question. Um, and, it, you know, to some extent, it you're going to get a different answer based on the profile of business you ask about. So, or you ask it of. So, um, what we're talking about are really three sort of distinct, um, you know, tiers, as you mentioned, and they really have their own function, their own purpose. So, you know, there are some massive, you know, wine companies out there that actually do their own distribution for the most part um, and can sort of manage all the logistics and delivery of that, even on a national pretty much level, right? Um, most wineries can't do that. Um, so for uh, King of State, for example, we're distributed in all 50 states. Um, and we have an extremely close relationship with our, our distributors. We, we, we're, we're on their radar every week if we can be <laughs> you know it's we try to be top of mind um, by being good and engaged partners with them um, in the work that we have to do together and and as you mentioned I mean it's it, it's so essential to have a team of people out if you have a team of people out there your distributors uh, sales representatives out there uh, showing the wines to the market you know explaining the origins of the vineyard or the, the backstory of the vineyard that they're tasting I mean it really is a people industry and from the retailer to the distributor to the supplier there's a lot of actual um, crossover I mean uh, we, we will often go and work in markets um, with our distributor reps and visit their accounts with them to go pour the wines uh, for their buyers. So there's actually a, quite a lot of interaction between the tiers, just nationally speaking, not just for, for Oregon. But um, so, it, they, you know, distributors uh, for wineries that are producing a, a higher number of bottles and they need, they, they need distribution, they really serve a, a, a critical, um, you know, function uh, for, for moving that inventory, as you mentioned. <laughs> I was just going to um, comment quickly um, my husband has been in wine sales his entire professional career. And just the funny story of when we moved to Oregon and his first sales call, um, he got an order for two of that, one of that, three of that. And he put in the order for cases and the wine got delivered to the account. And because it's, you know, cash on delivery, they're like, no, 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 bottles. And my husband came back and was like, oh my gosh, we're going to have a lot of adjusting to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a very unique market. Like I said, the, the cash on delivery warps it. And I'm not in a position to say it's good or bad. I mean, I think a restaurant doesn't like it, but it changes the, the purchasing behavior. One thing I would add is that I think anecdotally I hear this nationally, and it, it is true in Oregon to some extent. There's been a consolidation on the wholesale distribution level, just like in a lot of, and that affects... Um, a lot of small wineries' ability to get their wines on shelves because everybody's fighting for that shelf space or that, that bottle on the list or that by the glass placement. And when you have larger and larger distribution companies um, eating up smaller ones, you, you do lose choice. And, you know, it's really hard as a small winery to get the attention of that sales rep. So um, I would say that's happening in Oregon, but Oregon still has a very vibrant, smaller, independent wholesale yeah. um, industry. Very unusually so, it's to be honest. Yes. Very Thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, Sharon Reed, uh, City Club member. Uh, quick uh, apology to Justin. I was on an international flight, I think on United and business class, and they offered King Estate Pinot Gris, and I declined because I said, I live like 15, 16 miles <laughs> from the King Estate where I can get it and enjoy it whenever I want. So, uh, but thank you. A question though, you mentioned some varietals. Are, what are some of the new exciting varietals coming up that we should keep an eye open for as they develop? Thank you. Sure. Um, so there's been a lot of uh, interest in varietals from the Jura region in France. So Trousseau, um, Plassard, um, Savignin, these are all ones that probably, unless you drink Jura, you've never heard of. Um, there are, uh, there's quite a bit of Chenin being planted um, and really interesting things. There's some varietals that used to be part of 
very prominent in the beginning of the organ wine industry that we're starting to see a resurgence of, Riesling and Gewürztraminer um, in particular. Um, so, I mean, that's the same a few, but, but literally it's, it's hundreds upon hundreds of varietals um, that are being planted or, or grafted. Um, so yeah, I, I, the, the, um, it's an exciting time. Oregon's always been a very, uh, um, experiment, experimental state when it comes to, um, what, trying different, trying out different varieties in different parts of the state. Um, right now in Southern Oregon, you're seeing a lot of focus on Malbec. You're seeing, um, focus on Tempranillo down there. Um, one thing that I have to kind of give a shout out to is Sauvignon Blanc because, um, they're... Uh, the Sauvignon Blanc from Oregon is just showing incredibly um, from all the different producers I've had it from. Um, but there's a, there's really less than 100 acres of it planted in the state right now. Um, King Estate currently is the only uh, Oregon winery that's uh, distributing nationally distributing uh, comprehensively um, an Oregon Sauvignon Blanc. So it's a new category for the state. But there's enough of it out there that it's starting to sort of um, actually get some distribution, which is really exciting. So um, keep an eye out for Oregon Sauvignon Blanc. The other thing I would say just really quickly, sorry, is, uh, is sparkling. <clears throat> and the sparkling, um, the varieties, are, it's typically Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier. Um, but people are experimenting, of course, with different varieties. But sparkling is, and is another really important, um, I guess, next act for, for the Oregon wine industry. Yeah, I was just, I'm, I sort of sometimes feel like I'm the mom. Um, I have three boys, they're all young, young men. Um, and I, I liked what you said earlier, is that there can be parallel approaches in a region. It's, it's not one or the other. Um, but at the end of the day, when you are a wine region of global prominence, like the Willamette Valley, it is important to stay rooted in what is the known and what brings us differentiation. So it's never, you know, diversity at the expense of what's established. It's the eco space for both. Um, and our uh, recognition for world-class Pinot Noir is only continuing to grow in importance. And you look at those regions that have more unfortunate impacts of climate change um, you know, our, our sister region in, in France, in Burgundy, has had, um, you know, a lot more impacts on growing conditions and harvest um, pricing is, um, you know, Oregon and Willamette Valley is very centered in good value pricing, not cheap, but when we're looking at, you know, luxury high-end wine, Willamette Valley Pinot Noir delivers exceptional value, and that's something that's you know differentiated and growing the category when we're we're traveling around the world. I would just add as an anecdote when I'm I usually go to Europe once or twice a year to taste wines at at events and things, and the most common response I get when I say I'm from Oregon is they go Pinot Noir, mm -hmm. whether they're from Spain, whether they're from Burgundy, whether they're from the Languedoc, it doesn't matter. So. It, it's true. I mean, in, in all across Europe, at least, where you think they're only thinking about European wine, they know the good Pinot Noir comes from Oregon. And Pinot Noir comes in different styles. Yes, indeed. So white Pinot Noir, you can get yours with, you know, less color. You can get it with bubbles. So I think, you know, just the diversity within Pinot Noir and style and winemaking approaches is really exciting, too. We love talking economics at City Club. We also love talking politics, and there is a politics of wine, and in recent years there have been efforts to increase taxes here in the state on wine, beer, and liquor, and indeed the state has a, a board looking into this question. And I wondered if you wanted to speak to that effort, whether you think the industry is, quote-unquote, paying its fair share, and also just more generally how you see the industry's responsibility to dealing with problems such as alcohol addiction. Well, it is, uh, it is <clears throat> I think, something that people in the wine industry are pretty acutely aware of, of uh, the dangers of, of overconsumption. And I think you will find that uh, folks in the wine industry tend to take that issue very seriously. 
especially folks who have tasting rooms, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also something that you have to be personally aware of as someone in the industry. You know, you go to these tasting events, like you mentioned, and, and you spend the whole day sipping, you know, um, alcohol. Uh, so um, it is something we have to be very aware of. I think um, we're seeing a, a renewed effort uh, among uh, some interests out there to, uh, I think, um, put out as much sort of negative content as they possibly can about about alcohol in general. Um, and, um, you know, I think our response to it as an industry has to be one of seeking to partner with uh, agencies, government agencies uh, and others to be um, supportive of, of messaging around responsible consumption. Um, does that mean that, um, you know, we support some of the other things that have been proposed? Not necessarily. I mean, we know that, for example, there was an Oregon Health um, or an OHA um, study that um, that uh, showed that their proposal for, their, for raising taxes on alcohol sales would actually have very little, if any, impact on curbing overconsumption. And that story was um, very, it was a kind of a, it was a national story when it happened, but they, the OHA kind of buried that report. It was a tax-funded fu tax report. Um, and so, you know, you, you see the interests, you know, and, 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 and how they're kind of operating, and it, it is what it is. Um, but we, I, I would just say the Oregon wine industry is, is absolutely supportive of, of um, you know, drinking in moderation and, and messaging around that. And uh, we're going to continue to do our part as individual businesses to uh, enforce that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the conversation about alcohol and uh, raising taxes and responsible consumption is not an Oregon unique story. Um, there is, you know, initiatives around the world for various reasons um, that are adding to this complex discussion. Um, wine is different. Wine is different than other alcoholic beverages. It has an incredible history, uh, a centering around culture, place, um, healthy lifestyle um, when in moderation. And I think it is even more important now uh, when we think of wine and community to also be um, transparent um, about overconsumption and re responsible drinking. Um, I am a family of, of an alcoholic father. I grew up uh, with those impacts every day and I chose to make my professional career in wine because I love everything about it. And unfortunately there are those, the, those who are not able um, to responsibly drink alcohol and wine, and they do need resources. They do need support. Um, it is a sickness. Um, so it's complicated. Um, and certainly, I think this idea of raising taxes to uh, curb consumption is um, clearly been demonstrated that, it's, that it's, it's not a clear path, that there is more that uh, both public health needs to be doing as well as the industry. Um, and that there isn't stigma, and that if people choose, you know, not to consume alcohol, that's fine too. Um, but I think we need to remember that wine is is very unique, and it's it holds a very special place in history and culture. Thank you. Lightning round, last question: What's the most exciting thing from your point of view about the future of the industry here in Eugene and the Willamette Valley? And you each have just one statement to tell us what you're most excited about. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, for Eugene. Yep. Uh, there are just not a lot of wineries around Eugene compared to the rest of you know other parts of wine country. There's a huge untapped potential around here, and while we have a lot of really great tradition, speaking to that like creativity, there is just endless possibilities locally still for new wineries and new ideas and building you know continuing to build the culture and a place to visit. I'm gonna refer back to being a mom. Um, you know, there's been discussions about wine losing its relevance with younger audiences. And I look at my three young men um, who are, you know, blossoming and have um, 
learned about wine and have a respect for wine. And I think when you are anchored in a university college town like Eugene, that this is uh, an amazing entryway and education for the future wine consumer. And also knowing that there can be, you know, alcohol and substance abuses within universities, that wine has a unique opportunity to educate um, on responsible consumption and get folks excited about wine um, that's unique because you have a university system. So I'm really excited and echo what you say. The Willamette Valley is, is certainly, from my vantage point, uh, looking very bright, but I think there's extra opportunity and untapped um, projects uh, here in, in the southern area. Well, I, I, I would say, having grown up down here and, um, and just sort of watched the evolution over the, a few decades, um, it, it gives me a lot of uh, hope and excitement for the future. I, I think the, um, the, the, the interesting thing about Oregon, just on a national stage, an international stage really, is that we don't really resemble anywhere else. We're not really a lot, we're not really, we're very unique. And, 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 and uh, we're also, again, despite the fact that we're 1% of the production in the country, we're pushing the limits or pushing the boundaries, pushing you know, what's possible for uh, sustainable agriculture, for uh, introducing new varieties that aren't being um, you know, uh, experimented with in many other places. I just think there's a lot of um, uh, innovation yet to come. There's a lot of growth yet to come. And I think we're gonna do that uh, as who, just being who we are, doing what we do. We don't have to copy another AVA or another region, another state. We just continue to do what we do, how we do it, and it's going to um, continue to, to grow and, and, to be, and to blossom into what it already has become. So, um, yeah, exciting, exciting future for the Oregon wine industry. That's all the time we have. Please join me in thanking our panel. This has been our May 10th conversation at the City Club of Eugene. Thanks very much to Andrew Smith and Joey Bruckner for putting together this program today. The two of them came to me. They had a vision for this, and they made it happen on the stage. So thank you to both of you. And that's, yes, indeed. And that's a lesson to you listening out there. If you have an idea, come to us. Make it happen. We'll help. City Club members, please be on the lookout for your email inbox next week. You're going to get your ballot with new board members and leadership, as well as a minor bylaw change proposal. So pending your votes, we will announce that new board at our May 31st meeting. Next Friday, May 17th, City Club will be back at the Maple Room, where we will explore 15th Night, the community movement to reduce youth homelessness. That forum is generously sponsored by Sapient Private Wealth Management. We're excited to see you then. Have a wonderful weekend and happy Mother's Day.